call the uh, May meeting of the um, Spokane Regional Health District Board of Health to order. Um, at the current time, we do not have a quorum, but we will go ahead and call the roll. We are expecting um, uh, a few more members to show up. I have heard from Shelley O'Quinn that she will be here. So uh, can we begin with Torney? Torney Smith, Spokane Regional Health District. Bob Bless, appointed member. Lori Kinnear, Spokane City. Michelle Fossum, legal counsel. Kevin Freeman, City of Millwood. Um, Susan Boyson, appointed member. Um, next on our agenda is item three, citizen input. Do we have any citizen input? Hearing no citizen input, um, I will move to item four, the chair report. Um, today on our, we have a few reports on the topics. Uh, first of all, a reminder that only um, six microphones can be on at one time. Please uh, turn your microphone off when not speaking, but that doesn't seem to be an issue today. Um, we will have an opioid treatment program overview as part of the meeting today. Um, there will also be, at the conclusion, there'll be a tour of the recently remodeled program offices immediately following the meeting today. So I would urge the members to uh, tag along to the uh, opioid treatment program uh, tour. Um, with the Spokane Regional Health District as the six county uh, regional lead for the youth marijuana prevention and education program, the uh, Regional Health District staff from the Healthy Communities Program is seeking to interview elected leaders, citizens, retailers, law enforcement, and community businesses in order to effectively plan intervention approaches for Spokane County. The staff would like to conduct 20 to 30 minute interviews with each elected Board of Health member during June. Um, the staff will uh, report back to the Board of Health on the results of the survey and then present the youth data regarding marijuana use at a future board meeting. So I would urge all of the electeds, <coughs> Laurie, <laughs> to, <laughs> uh, I have scheduled mine, um, my interview, so, uh, and I will, uh, I will nudge the other electeds and we'll get an email out to all of them to uh, get on with this. Laurie. Council Member Beggs and I. Council Member Beggs and I met with Our Lady of Lords Catholic Church, the cathedral, and the parishioners, as well as um, Father Connell. And there is a lot of concern around marijuana shops and churches. And so I would encourage Board of Health to also reach out to churches that may have youth programs, even though they are not a licensed daycare but reach out to those members as well to see if they have um, information that would be useful to the group. Thank you. Amber, Amber Waldorf has just uh, joined us. So we have uh, Councilwoman uh, Waldorf. I think you're up. <laughs> I have a quick um, update from the Health Officer Selection Committee. We are continuing to um, be, we are continuing with our evaluation of the Health Officer Selection process, and the committee is looking at some opportunities not only to um, adjust job descriptions for the Health Officer to what we feel are the uh, are, are best suited for for our district, but also look at where the actual role of director um, for the Spokane Regional Health District should lie, if it should lie with the um, health officer or the administrator. So um, we are in the process of considering that. We're reaching out to other um, other health districts in um, Washington. We've, we've uh, been able to talk with Kitsap. I've talked with uh, Tacoma Pierce. Um, we're going to have a conversation. The, the selection committee will have a conversation with Tacoma Pierce here in the very near future. And um, we hope that in the, in the very near future, we will bring back recommendations um, to, the, to the board as a whole for uh, what we see or if we see a need to, um, 
change the uh, directorship position from the health officer led director to an administrative led director. But that's we're still in the process of 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 evaluating that model, evaluating those models, and looking to see what the best model is for um, Spokane Regional Health District. Um, I've also we are down two members on the board. Um, I have talked with Spokane Valley, and they are looking to appoint their members. Probably, my, my guess is is that at the next me, at their next regular meeting, they will make their appointments. Um, they are currently down three members of their council, and so they are running a a lean ship over there. They've sigma six themselves. Um, so, and then lastly, as the chair in your packet, is a study that was performed and, and, and begun by um, Dr. Joel McCullough um, prior to his departure for a communication audit within the district. Um, within the, within the, within the, yeah, within the district, sorry. Um, I urge you to review this, um, senior staff. So the, um, executive leadership team, um, for the district has seen this and, um, is discussing this internally. Uh, please, please, please take a look through this, including the, um, comments and at some future point, um, Torney will be giving a presentation to the board in, in general as to um, what what they what the interpretation of this um, of this audit is and steps that are being taken to address some of these issues as a whole. So that will be forthcoming, but this is for the uh, board members' general digestion. Um, any committee reports? Amber, do you have anything? No, we are at policy committee is meeting next week, June 2nd. So we will have a report at the next meeting. Um, Mr. Baldwin is not here. Um, we gave the report on the selection committee. Um, and I have nothing else from the executive committee other than the audit. So that takes care of the chair report today. Um, next is the health officer report or yes so Anna Halloran if she can um, come on up and get the epi piece for us thank you hello everyone um, just a really brief update um, things have been pretty steady up in epi recently um, influence activity, it continues to wane. Uh, in May, we've only had five reported cases of hospitalizations for influenza compared to 59 in April and 92 in March. So it's dropping off quite nicely. Um, again, this year's season has been roughly half um, flu A and half flu B. And we recently dropped the masking recommendation for unvaccinated healthcare workers based on positivity rates in the emergency department. Um, and a quick update on Zika. Um, we uh, have submitted testing for 12 Spokane residents for Zika, including around eight pregnant women. Two of those results are still pending. There have been four cases confirmed in Washington State residents, all, all returned travelers. Um, there's a backlog of testing that continues at the CDC. However, um, it's become a little bit faster, and there's one commercial test that's now available that providers can order for individuals that have developed symptoms. Um, that test can be used within seven days of symptom onset. And um, for a U.S. update, there have been 591 um, cases identified, in, um, including 168 pregnant women, and no, no vector-borne transmission has occurred in the United States, though Puerto Rico continues to have troubles with that. Um, our numbers that I reported just now don't include Puerto Rico, however. And um, while things have been pretty steady in Epi, um, just a reminder that we're entering into our busy season. Um, so summer is, is pretty busy with increased reports of animal bites and contact with bats and um, increase in food and water and vector-borne diseases. Um, and that affects many of our programs outside of just Epi also. So we're getting ready to get really busy. Any questions? Questions for Anna? Thank you. Um, please let the record note that uh, Commissioner Al French has arrived, and we now have a quorum. 
Tony. Thank you. Um, as uh, Chair Freeman mentioned, uh, we do have the communications audit that is back. We have been spending time with our executive leadership team going through and pulling out themes and um, processes that we see we think that need to be addressed. In many instances, this reinforced uh, things that were learned as we went through our strategic planning work uh, and will overlap with that. And we will be planning to have a little more dialogue at the exec leadership team um, with these um, themes, and then we will distribute these to all staff along with the full report. So that will be going out to them within the next um, week or so. Another piece that is in your packet that uh, I have referred to before is the visit on July 11th by Dr. Karen DeSalvo, the Assistant Secretary of Health, and Dr. Patrick O'Carroll, the Assistant Surgeon General for the U.S., who are here to uh, learn from Spokane. They have identified five cities across the U.S. that have been demonstrating what Dr. DeSalvo refers to as Public Health 3.0, and that is attached behind her biography in the handout. Uh, presentation that she did at the American Public Health Association for the closing session to define what she is looking at as Public Health 3.0. Um, we will um, hopefully have uh, all of you present if you are in town. Uh, there is opportunities that will begin at 9 o'clock and goes to 4 with different panel sessions and then breakouts in the afternoon. The final planning for that is um, getting close we will be on a planning call tomorrow with representatives from Dr. DeSalvo's office in D.C. and uh, trying to finalize um, participation and membership. So I uh, expect that you will all be getting uh, hold the date, but it's July 11th. If you're available, would love to have you participate. So at this moment, those are the only two things I have to cover. Any questions? Questions for Tony? Thank you very much. Next on the agenda is the uh, consent agenda consisting of uh, the meeting minutes from the uh, April 28th, 2016 meeting and the April vouchers. Do I have a motion on the consent agenda? Move approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Consent agenda passes. Thank you. Next are our action items. Um, today we have a potential action on resolution 16-02, encouraging schools with grades 6 through 12 in Spokane County to participate in the Healthy Youth, Youth Survey every two years. Do we have a staff report on that? Yes, please, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. I can do just a quick review. Um, so the proposed resolution is really about encouraging full participation in the Healthy Youth Survey um, of all schools in Spokane County. Um, the survey, it really provides some very important information, not just to the health district, but to many other um, entities in the areas, as well as the schools themselves. And we're able to get the information at a statewide level um, by county, by school districts, and by schools. And it covers a variety of factors, a lot of which that relate to risk behaviors, such as alcohol or tobacco use. And then other ones that are really more around the environment that children are living in, whether that's the school environment or home environment or the community in general. Um, it really does provide incredibly valuable information. Um, it helps us understand what student needs are as well as what their behaviors are. So we can really design some appropriate um, interventions and prevention uh, programs to help them. Uh, one quick example of how we've used this recently was uh, related to tobacco, vaping, and marijuana. Uh, the survey information was very critical in helping to get the state legislation passed this year. Um, it also helped in the justification for your recent smoking in public places action. Um, and we've also used it um, to improve our responses to um, poisonings and intoxications related to vaping devices um, with our programs here at the district. 
Two of the concerns we touched on last time, first of which is not all schools participate. Some schools are identified at the state level to participate. Even those that are identified, not all of those do. Um, most of the ones who aren't um, randomly selected choose not to participate. Um, the implications of this is we just don't have um, complete information about adolescent health and issues that they're facing. Um, and we really can't get it down to that specific school level or a school district level um, so we can really design um, interventions and prevention efforts um, really at those much more um, detailed levels. levels. Um, one example of why this is a concern is uh, recently uh, Priority Spokane, of which uh, the health district is a member, um, was working in middle schools really to address attendance and behaviors, and those kinds of things. And um, they had data from one year in which four middle schools um, had participated in the survey, and then the next year only one middle school participated. So they really had a lack of information to really be able to assess trends um, and then also to then um, target interventions based on the different behaviors of each of those schools. Um, also, the second um, issue has to do with there's two versions of the survey, um, one of which includes um, questions around sexual behavior, sexual abuse, and sexual orientation. Most schools choose not to participate with those questions. In 2014, only three schools did. And so really, without these questions being used, we don't know um, the, the extent of certain behaviors, and we really can't um, develop interventions nor be able to evaluate those interventions if we don't have good, um, consistent data over the years. So as uh, um, this, uh, your resolution shows, this is really about encouraging schools to participate. It's encouraging them to use all of the questions and also encouraging that the uh, school district adopt policies um, concerning um, school participation and the use of um, all the optional questions in their districts. That's all I had. I know at the last meeting, um, Shelly O'Quinn had suggested meeting with uh, DSI's school superintendent group, and I know she and Stacy attended that meeting, and she's not here to provide any input. I don't know if Stacy had anything in particular out of that meeting. So no particular concerns expressed by the schools um, in terms of this resolution. I don't um, didn't really hear anything. So any questions at this time? Commissioner French. So um, <clears throat> as you described the the resolution and and speak about you know the. Uh, Resolution encouraging participation, which I very much support. Um, um, challenged by bullet point number three in the DAO, therefore, that says adopt policies requiring mandatory participation. And I can see how some of the school districts would um, maybe have some um, issues with our ability to require them to do anything yeah. and stuff. So. Uh, what was the thought process in terms of inserting the requiring mandatory participation language as opposed to continuing to use encouraging participation? Yeah, the, the language, as I recall, is we are encouraging school districts to adopt policies that mandate their schools and their districts to participate. So we're not requiring anything or mandating. We're encouraging the districts to adopt policies that require their schools to participate. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, okay. I can I can see that kind of interpretation. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions for Linda? Amber. Well, I'm I'm sorry, Commissioner Quinn couldn't couldn't be here because I know she was going to that meeting. Mm -hmm. And was there any feedback as to why certain schools or districts haven't participated in the last several years? Was it just time in the classroom. I mean, yeah. was there any feedback as to how we can make it easier for the schools to make it happen? Yeah, I think in general, um, a lot of the schools don't participate. It's just a matter of juggling all the other requirements they have on them. Um, it's a time issue. Um, they have other testing they have to do, those kinds of things. Um, uh, administratively, there's a certain burden there. Um, in terms of the uh, sexual-related questions, a lot of them um, are concerned about participating. They've gotten a lot of um, pushback from parents. Um, and we did hear from, I believe it was Lindy or Stacy last time, talking about the fact that some of the schools actually would kind of welcome 
this resolution because it sort of takes a little bit of the pressure off of them when it comes to the parents that if they had somebody else kind of encouraging you know that they ask those questions it's a kind of a way to help work with the parents so. thank you huh? If they want to, if they That would be helpful since uh, Commissioner O'Quinn is not here at the time. She was indicating that she would come, but if you could share some information of what went on at the set, at the superintendent's meeting or at the ESD 101, that would be beneficial. Also, please let the record note that um, Council Member uh, Biggis arrived. Thank you. So I'd, I'd like to make a comment that the conversation kind of continued after me. She really um, requested that they specifically look over the resolution and give feedback. I don't know if that occurred or what feedback she could bring back. So I can only speak to what I was there for and what I heard. What I heard from the schools is um, they did kind of fixate first on the sexual health questions, and we had a lot of conversations about um, they tend to get some feedback from some smaller parental groups that are pretty vocal. I don't think by themselves any of them were against asking it, um, but we did remind them that at no point does it does doing the survey um, make a kid complete those questions or the survey itself. So I'd remind you at any time a parent or the student can opt out of the survey. So and that's in their IRB, the governing you know IRB Institutional Review Board uh, documents that guide that. Um, there was some questions that I filled out around data quality. Folks were a little bit uncertain of, can we, we trust the data? And so I kind of went through some of the background and where those questions went, and I felt confident in saying, if it's administered properly, it's, it's the best, most reliable data source that we have on, on that age group. Um, we talked in general about, um, you know, the, the two-pronged issues is not just the sexual health questions. I did talk a little bit about the inequities that not asking those questions create. So, for instance, there's populations in the school systems that are um, those same kids that might be at risk for some of the sexual risk behaviors or whatnot are at the same risk for some of the drug and alcohol conditions. And, and our, some of our community groups are really disadvantaged by not being able to have information to target interventions. And so... Talked a little bit about that, um, some nods around the room, but there wasn't. Um, we, they did talk about, Shelley asked him pretty pointedly, you know, would this resolution help you in a position to do that? And basically we got, you know, fight, they're going to fight their battles is kind of what we heard. So it just really depends on what's on their agenda and what's going to be important for them to take issue with at the time. So. In my perspective, passing the resolution is a step in that right direction, and it supports our advocacy efforts and plans in supporting the schools. Is it a magic bullet? Probably not. But is it a step in the right direction? Certainly. And just on that note, we showed this at the last one. I left it out this time initially. But these are the kinds of things we're going to be providing with the schools to help take the Board of Health resolution a step further. Um, really helping them with technical assistance, coordinating with um, ESD 101, helping them by attending meetings, explaining things to parents, those kinds of things. So. Um, trying to think of anything else to communicate. Dr. Redinger, you know, did talk about um, Spokane Public Schools being more on the leading edge of adoption of some of these things. They are actively considering some of those questions and having those internal discussions with their human growth and development committee. So those wheels are turning, so it's just a, a process. Any other questions? Al? So <clears throat> um, I'm assuming that the surveys, survey results are anonymous? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, describe for me how the surveys are administered. Um, is it a take home? Is it yeah, a class? Uh, you know, the kids that are in a class and then given the survey and they have to respond to it there. How, how's that handled? Yeah, so it's um, one of the questions that was raised by a gentleman in the group asked, you know, it'd be a lot easier for us if we can administer the survey integration with, like, human development curricula or whatever. The problem with that is, is because it's such a clearly defined survey method that's statewide, there's pretty exacting procedures that schools need to follow. So it's administered during a very specific window of time in October. During one class period, it's in the class period with um, 
teacher kind of directions and oversight. So it's very controlled, if that makes sense. So students do um, take it during one class period. So do, do the students and the parents know ahead of time that the yes. survey is going to be administered on this kind of a day? Yes. And so are there instructions that are, or a description that's given to the students and the parents about the nature of the survey yep. and that the questions with regard to the sexual orientation and stuff yes. are optional? Yes. Yeah, okay. and as a matter of fact, in this next go round um, for the survey administration, they're actually beefing up the um, requirements for schools to actually, I think it's like log back in the system and say we actually um, communicated with students and parents on these days via this means. So okay. those requirements are all set. They're also required to have an optional different activity for students to do during that time should they opt out. So that's okay. all part of the pretty tightly controlled procedures around it. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Amber. So I make a motion that we approve resolution 16 02. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion? Al? Got to be smarter. Uh, um, having not participated in any of the previous conversations and stuff, my initial gut reaction to the resolution was, uh, as a parent, I would be very uh, cautious about putting my child in a situation to where they had to respond to a survey um, and not had the benefit of being able to opt out or, quite frankly, had the opportunity to discuss uh, with the parent um, about comfort with regard to answering some of these questions. So based upon your conversation or based upon your description of the process, it sounds like those protections and opportunities for uh, making decisions about the level of participation are available to the students prior to finding themselves in a classroom with a survey in front of them saying, Thou shalt fill out the survey, kind of a deal. So, it's I appreciate. Very much prescribed. The whole yeah, process. I appreciate that background and stuff. And so, based upon those kind of parameters, I'm comfortable supporting this, um, so that those options, as long as those options are available to both the parents and the and the students. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I would just say that we. You know, it goes without saying, our children are our biggest resource, and we're very concerned, and they have many challenges. And I'm just so interested in having the data because I want to protect them. And without the data, uh, we can't do it. And uh, as challenging, actually, as even answering the survey as it might bring things up, I, I think it's more than um, overcome by what the value. And then we can then design programs that will address whether it's substance abuse. Um, sexual violence, self-harming behaviors. And so I, if everyone does it, then we'll really be better off. And so I, I don't want to have a pocket in the county where we don't have the data and we can't design a program from them. So I'm going to be supporting it. Anyone else? We have a motion for uh, approval on the floor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, Resolution 1602 passes. Thank you very much. Next are our reports. Uh, first up is an Administration Division overview from Tony Smith. Good afternoon again. Um, being that most of you, or probably all of you, understand what goes on in finance or human resources or uh, IT, I was not going to belabor going through a description. Uh, there are a couple of um, references following each of these sections that talk about what goes on there, and I would be most happy or to have my managers um, describe for you details if you had specific questions afterwards. What I really wanted to do here mostly was go through and let you meet people that you perhaps haven't met, 
Uh, some of these you know very well. Uh, but to begin with, in human resources, Sue Winters is the manager for human resources. Uh, in finance, most of you know Mike, and he is hiding out behind you back there. <laughs> Um, Linda does communications, Linda Graham. Our IS information systems work is done by Todd Miller, oversees that unit. Building maintenance is Brad Woods, and Brad uh, is at a doctor's appointment right now, and so he was not able to be here. Um, Patricia Rhodes does a few things. She oversees our HIPAA work, the records management, and standards and accreditation. So she's engaged in all of those. All of those services are really primarily internally focused. In addition to that, we have some services that are more externally oriented. So financial services with Paula Maxwell, and this is where all of the bills and so on are paid, all of the billing that goes on through OTP or environmental public health. Uh, also, Paula oversees the vital records components, so birth and death records that are maintained. Uh, again, you've all worked a lot with Linda on public policy issues, which is really an external facing piece. And then Kim Kramars oversees the work that goes on with contracts and agreements we have. So these are the folks that are really doing all the work. Uh, terrific staff to work with. And if you have any particular questions about specifics of what they do, I would entertain you asking them while they're here. Um, any, I, I could not be more proud of the great work they've done. All of the audits that we've had, all of the checks have been done uh, incredibly well. We have not had findings or issues, so things are going very well under their guidance. The other thing that I wanted to cover from the admin side has to do with our strategic plan. And it does link back to uh, what we identified earlier in the communications audit. But there are four main goals in our strategic plan. The first ones are really focused very much internally, looking at working on the environment for employees and strengthening communications within the organization. Then we're looking at what our work is really around, which is impacting inequities and figuring out how can we find ways in our community to give everyone an opportunity to achieve the healthiest life that they individually can by reducing disparities that lead to differences in health outcomes. Finally, um, we are looking at kind of what is emerging, where are we going in the world, and our goal four group, which has been very active, is really helping us look forward. This work is tracked uh, on this, which I know you can't read any detail on, but this Gantt chart was something that Linda had initially set up. Uh, Dr. Joel had Linda doing a great deal of the organization and coordination as we went through putting our strategic plan together. If you look more closely at this one little section, you will see that for each one of the goals, we also then have a number of tasks. There's 25 different ones. And I have assumed Dr. Joel's role of being responsible to shepherd this process. So this lives on my desk, which is an ongoing uh, tracking of where are we on those steps. And at this point in time, everybody is up to speed with the uh, expectation for what their task group was. So each one of the task groups then has in a tracker a system that identifies what their task was, who's working on it, where you see Dr. Joel's name, that is now my responsibility, and then the details of where we are, uh, what is to begin or not. There are three different tiers of level that we're beginning to work on, so we're still in mostly tier one activities. Um, and so I can keep you apprised of any of this as we go along. Certainly can let this information be put on the website where you can see it in your health, in your uh, Board of Health page if you would like as well. So that is basically a brief update on the strategic planning work that we're doing uh, through admin. Questions? Any questions for Tony or for anybody uh, who was kind enough to come down from the admin group to uh, uh, put faces with names? Anyone? Bob. Kevin. Hi. 
Tony, I was just curious. One of the things we had discussed previously were metrics, <coughs> sort of process measures, and are those in place, or how are you, A, are they in place, and if so, how are you <coughs> measuring them or acknowledging them? Uh, yes, they are in place, and each of the task groups has the responsibility to identify how will they know when they've achieved certain amounts, and we'll be tracking those as we go through. Some of the task groups have had to modify what was originally set out as a task sure. as they dove into that, but will then modify metrics to identify okay. uh, achievement. Okay, good, thanks. Other folks? None. Tony, thank you very much. Thank you. So next we have uh, Julie, o Julie Albright from our Opioid Treatment Services Program. Good afternoon. And I, I'm from Treatment Services. And first we're going to kind of talk about TB. And... Our tuberculosis program and treatment and case management for adults and children diagnosed with TB. We have one uh, public health nurse too, which is Katie Dickinson. I'm going to have her come up and talk about our program. She's the one who runs our program and works with all of our clientele that comes in. Hello, everyone. Well, like Julie said, my name is Katie Dickinson, and I'm the TB program coordinator. And when I say program, it's pretty much me and the health officer and Julie. Um, we do have some um, nurses that work in the OTP program that offer backup as well. Um, but I offer backup and OTP um, help with dispensing of the methadone. Um, I work with the Class B refugees, um, Class B uh, refugees and immigrants coming into Spokane, um, they go through a pretty extensive medical evaluation before migrating to the U.S., and that's um, for wherever they go in the U.S., but anyone that comes here to Spokane, um, I get notification from the CDC through their EDN system, um, and it's an electronic disease notification system that is used in all 50 states of the U.S., um, and it pretty much tracks the arrival of these persons um, to each state. Um, Sorry. <laughs> so the tuberculosis program, um, we partner with local clinics and medical facilities um, regarding TB education and consultation for screening and treatment. I answer a lot of phone calls every day from physicians having multiple questions about screening, um, treatment, um, questions about checks, desk, x-rays. Um, I help collect a lot of sputum on individuals, uh, physicians kind of back away at that point, um, so I go in and help with that. <laughs> it's pretty important with um, the diagnosis of TB, sputum. Anyway, I also work with the Department of Health. We do do monthly meetings and annual meetings regarding cases for each jurisdiction within the state. Um, the TB program here, we order our medications through the state um, pharmacy in King County, so that's where we get our medications for TB disease only, um, LTBI treatment, and screening really starts, and um, our local physicians do a great job, and tr they treat LTBI. Um, Unified Community Health, the Northeast Community Center. Um, so once um, these B-class refugees and immigrants, mostly refugees, though, um, get funneled kind of with the aid of World Relief as our local refugee resettlement agency, um, the CDC does require that if they are um, TB B class individual to be reassessed for active disease within 30 days of arrival um, and all of that assessment um, is performed by the Unified Community Health Clinic. Um, so the tuberculosis program, their major work and outcomes, um, we collaborate um, with the health officer and case management of individuals with TB disease. It's my job to initiate um, TB disease we monitor for drug resistance and possible side effects of the medications that they're on. Um, typical treatment lasts anywhere from 6 to 12 to 2 years. Luckily, we haven't had anybody on treatment longer than a year here in Spokane, but it is possible. Um, we do do this, or I do this through DOT. It's important that I go and watch every individual take their medication 
every day for the full length of treatment. The purpose of that is to cut down on any um, possibility of drug resistance forming and just to make sure that they're taking them as directed. Um, it's not a nice course per se of treatment. It's usually about four different medications, 12 drugs to get through. So you know how challenging it is just to take a multivitamin every day. And then my job is also to perform contact investigations. If anybody is diagnosed with active TB, it's my job to go out and screen everyone that's involved with this individual and make sure that they're, they're okay. Um, I do provide education through trainings here at the health district. Um, like I said earlier, a lot of the local clinics are really our main people on the ground um, that are doing the initial screening for TB and then LTBI treatment. Um, so we do a lot of trainings on what LTBI is, signs, symptoms, and then the appropriate drug regimens for those individuals. Our long-term outcomes would decrease morbidity, morbidity and mortality here in Spokane County, but within Washington State as a whole. Um, we have seen a little bit of an increase in active TB here in Washington State, so it's something that the state is um, concerned about, and it's, a, it's still a big deal. So um, challenges to my work is working with individuals that do not speak English um, and providing culturally sensitive and appropriate education for those individuals. Again, providing an um, education on LTBI. Countries um, do not treat individuals for LTBI, so it's um, rather confusing when I have a refugee or immigrant that comes here to the health district or to Unify, and now they're told they have TB. And it really does hold a pretty big stigma um, around the world to be kind of labeled with having TB disease, and it's um, quite frightening for those individuals. So I help work with that, work with them, get through that, get them through treatment, and try and overcome any challenges that they face. Um, possible ideas that you all should be aware of is the Department of Health TB program is reviewing the idea of mandating LTBI to become a reportable condition within the next two years. I think the major concern is um, most of our cases here in Washington are usually individuals that have LTBI, have never gone on treatment, and then we see later on in life as our immune systems become compromised, they start developing TD, TB disease. So I think you're going to see a big, big push for more individuals and more tracking of LTBI here within the state. Could I, could I ask a question for the non-medical of us? Sure. Could you briefly explain the difference between LTBI and active TB? Sure. So LTBI stands for latent tuberculosis infection. So you can be exposed to the TB bacteria. It is an airborne um, bacteria in the air. So someone that's infectious coughs the bacteria into the air. There's a lot of factors that play into becoming infected, but you can become infected but not have full-blown TB disease. And TB disease is the actual disease where you have the bacteria replicating um, in your lungs. We primarily see TB in the pulmonary cavities or your lung cavities, but it can actually be anywhere where blood flows in your body. I've had one gentleman here from the Marshall Islands, and he had TB around the, meningi the meninges around his brain and he was on treatment for a year. So, and we've had other cases here prior to me taking over the program of in the lymph nodes and wounds. And does that clear that up for you? Okay. <laughs> so I do believe that we do play a key role in surveillance for Spokane County. I hear all the time from providers in town that we're a great resource for them and they know of, they can call me if, with any questions. And if I don't have the answer, I'll, I'll definitely find that for them. Um, I think how you guys can provide support to the TB program um, is hiring a health officer who's knowledgeable in public health policy and definitely aware of all the local health disparities within our community. And definitely a health officer um, who's current with TB screening and treatment practices based on state and national guidelines. I can't do my job without a health officer. Some days I wish I was a physician so I could just make those decisions myself. But it is <laughs> important that you have someone who is knowledgeable and passionate about TB and, and knowledgeable about drug resistance and infection control practices. Um, we don't have, I think the state only had four um, MDR cases. So MDR cases are cases of TB that are resistant to drugs that we have. The challenge with TB is 
treatment has been the same for a very long time. So if we have a, someone who has a bacteria that's resistant to the few drugs that we have, they're um, diagnosed with multi-drug resistance and a big challenge um, to treat. We have had one lady who was resistant to a few medications, but, but not by clinical de definition MDR case. Um, but this, the Department of Health TB program is becoming more um, concerned about MDR cases coming in as we're having more refugees coming in from other parts of the world. Any questions for me? Questions for Katie? Um, Lori and then Bob. I know how to push a button. <laughs> what, are, what are the numbers of active cases in Washington or in Spokane County? In Spokane, I currently have one. Um, when I started, took over the program two years ago, I had five. I think the most Spokane has had over the last five years is about seven. So we're not one of the bigger counties for the state um, in general. Um, I think Washington counties with the ten top cases or ten or more cases is Nahomish, Pierce, King, and Yakima. So we don't have a lot of active TB here. In and what do you do in the case of somebody who's resistant to the drugs that you're giving them? How do you treat that? Luckily, knock on wood, we haven't had to face that yet. Um, you, there's um, first-line drugs and then second-line drugs. Um, so you kind of, it's kind of a game to see who can tolerate what. And you go through the list of medications you have and see how well um, they tolerate the medication. I do want to bring up a key point um, that as this health department is responsible for covering costs of treatment and screening, pretty much screening and treatment costs if the families aren't able to pay, um, the CDC estimated treatment cost per case for TB infection is around $700. For TB disease, it's anywhere from $17,000 to $44,000 per case. And then for MDR cases, um, it's about 150000 to 282000 per individual with MDR. So it can be expensive. It's complex. It's usually using antibiotics where they have to have pick lines inserted, and they're mostly injectable medications. So, Thank you. yeah. Uh, yeah, common. I've actually had a chance to work with Katie uh, with Rockwood. Uh, I was able to talk with Katie a number of months ago and went through our policy internally on how we manage. We do a lot of screenings uh, for Eastern Washington, EWU, as well as WSU nursing programs. And so it was really good talking with her, having a great resource here. We went through our policy, found that we were in compliance with all the recommendations, so that was really good. And then secondly, just a, a question for you, Katie. Uh, it's interesting if, you're, if the consideration by the DOH is to uh, categorize or to capture LTBI patients because it's a huge number. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do with those individuals? Because, you know, statistically only a small percentage are actually going to march over to be active TB. Right. So, you know, do you have any sense of what they're talking about doing in that regard? I really don't. They're at the kind of just the beginning of the discussion and how they would go about doing that. So I, I don't yeah. have any... It's a big job. Um, I track the numbers just for our TB class. So typically, Spokane can get anywhere from, and it varies month to month, from 50 refugees to hundreds of refugees every month. And so I only track maybe about five or six of those are TBB class refugees. So someone that the CDC is really concerned about, the adherence just to LTBI, if those individuals go on, is very low. So. It, it's going to be, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's going to fall back still on the primary providers to treat and still keep up. I mean, just to put it in perspective, uh, the, CDC, the CDC estimates there's about 11 million patients in the country with LTBI, and only about 5% of the low, most of those are low risk, but only 5 to 10% are going to actually progress on to active TB. And then you have certain categories, risk categories, like people with HIV AIDS, who are much higher risk, and therefore those people definitely need to be treated. But again, when you have a huge number of, of individuals with that category, I being one of them, I, you know, I ended up learning, you know, at a young age that my grandmother was in a sanitarium, and so I've been a I've been an LTBI patient, or you know, labeled, you know, since I was about six, um, and never got treated. 
So for me, it's kind of an interesting conversation <laughs> about, okay, stay away from me. But, uh, but as I said, I, mean, I think it's interesting from the standpoint of just how do you go about doing that when you have a huge population of individuals who have that label, and yet statistically very few are going to go on to, to develop active disease. Interesting. Well, I'm always bugging Dr. Joel to open up a clinic here, but I'm not getting any... Um, <laughs> buy in on that, but uh, I think it's going to be a lot on then on my part to get out and educate providers and really get everybody on board. So, thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to go on to the opioid treatment program, and you hear the words opioids and opiates, and so I put up here opiates and are drugs derived from opium and opioids is used to refer to synthetic opiates. Now the term is used interchangeably. And so the entire family of opiates, including synthetic and semi-synthetic. The opioid treatment program work with individuals who have substance use disorder. The primary drug of choice is opioids. Per WAC, you must have an opioid disorder for at least a year. And our clinic right now, we serve 737 individuals. In January of 2016, we went before the county commissioners, and our OTP census was raised to 1,000. So we can bring 1,000 patients onto our clinic. Um, our opioid treatment program, this is everybody that's in our program, that our staff that's in our program. Our opioid treatment program, we're very regulated and audited. It were by the Washington State DBHR, the Federal SAMHSA, DEA, Pharmacy Board, and by Spokane County um, Regional Behavioral Health. In our opioid treatment program, this is what they do. They just don't come in and say, hey, I want to get on the program. We have a whole protocol that they have to follow. Individuals come in, they sign up, they're on our wait list. If they're Medicaid funded, um, they're private pay, VA, now American, Indian, Alaska Native. Um, they're, all, they're a different funding stream. Each individual signs up, they follow the same protocol. They have to come in, fill out their demographic demographic information, they leave a urinalysis sample, and what we're doing is when they do that, we're testing for different drugs, but the drug that we're looking for most is benzodiazepines. If a person comes up positive for an illicit benzodiazepine, we don't allow them on our clinic, and the reason why is, is because mixing a benzodiazepine and methadone is very lethal. They can die. And so if they're taking illicit benzodiazepines, we don't want to bring that into our clinic. If they have a prescription for it, we can monitor that with their doctor. Um, when the individual has an assessment, it's with a CDP, chemical dependency professional. That's a state WAC. If the individual is assessed with the opioid dependence, the individual then will see our ARNP the next day. And this is the first day OTP gets paid. So every time a person comes in and has a urinalysis, <clears throat> and when they're assessed, we're not getting any payment. So it's the first day that they receive their dose is when we get paid Medicaid funding. Can I ask a question? Sure. I'm sorry. Um, I guess it's a good thing that maybe I don't know all the different drugs, but I, what is the one that you said is not? Yeah, what is that? It, yeah. Oh. That's one of them. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Well, I guess I Xanax, know Valium. I know the common layman's terms for it. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Your anti anxiety drugs. And anything that ends with a PAM, pretty much. Individuals, they're all in. All of our individuals are enrolled in the EDI system, and the EDI system is a system that all the hospitals use. And so when our individuals go into an emergency department, immediately we get notification that they're at the emergency department. Then that way, when they come into the clinic the next day or a few days later, that we put a dose hold on them, so then they're checked into our nurse practitioner. Then we're checking to see if they were in, if they received any other medications, what they went in for. 
We check in the PMP system, the prescription monitoring program. We're checking to see if they're getting any other drugs from any other doctors. When, they, when first beginning, the individual needs blood work. Um, the individual comes into the clinic daily. They're dispensed methadone right now. Randomly, they have urinalysis and breath analysis. They receive counseling per state WAC and federal guidelines. When they first start, they receive weekly counseling for the first 90 days, and then they can have counseling monthly. But it also depends on where they're at in their treatment. Some may still stay on weekly counseling, some may go to once every two weeks, and then some may go to monthly. Individuals see our nurse practitioner, and they also see our medical director, who's a psychiatrist. On our, on our program, individuals become stable on the program. And becoming stable on our program, they, de they decrease their illicit drug use. They are back in the workforce. They take care of their children. They're going to school. Um, they're not drug seeking. They're not doctor shopping. They're not going to the emergency department. They're not getting new crimes. So when they become stable on our program, they're back in society. They're helping back in our society instead of taking away. Challenges to completing our work is the new change in our funding system. Our new change in our funding system for Medicaid is a new BHO instead of the state. That's been a big change for us, which went to the rain tree system, so we're getting used to that. Um, figuring out how, how to bring buprenorphine into our clinic. It's a different form of medication and how to be paid to bring buprenorphine in for Medicaid-funded individuals and having a mental health license. So we want to have our mental health license also so that for our patients that we're seeing that we can also do mental health counseling. It's really hard to get mental health counseling out in our community for our folks because right now the funding stream out there is so dried up. It's just difficult for them to be out there. So to get them into uh, Frontier Behavioral Health or into Lutheran, it's difficult. To get them there, it's difficult. They just kind of get lost along the way. So methadone's a long-acting synthetic opioid. It's a full agonist. Buprenorphine's a partial agonist. The mis misuse of buprenorphine is less likely than methadone to result in death. But the difference in it is on buprenorphine, your tolerance level can't be as high. So you need both drugs in a, um, me a medication-assisted therapy. The reason why is, like I said, your tolerance level can't be as high on buprenorphine. So somebody may do really well on methadone, but not as well on buprenorphine, and vice versa. Board of Health members can help provide support to the program by understanding the work that we do and having leadership understand substance use disorders and mental health issues. And I know I went through that really quick, but I was given a time limit. So do I have any questions? Questions for Julie. Lori. So how long does a person stay on methadone? Some people will stay on it for life. Some people will be able to go off of it. And the reason why is because the brain chemistry change. All of us have in us what's called a mu receptor and opioid receptor in our brain and in our gut. So it's a natural. And when your tolerance level builds, you build more receptor sites. And so when somebody is not taking the drug, what happens is you go in withdrawals. And so you go through all the sickness. Well, your natural can't fill all those new receptor sites up. So you go through all the withdrawal symptoms, but what happens is your brain's still craving. Some people will be able to taper down and off. So other people won't. It's kind of like somebody taking an anti-anxiety drug um, or a mental health, that their brains change, so they'll have to stay out the rest of their life. The ones that taper down and off, the other thing that we tell them is really watch out when you're going for dental work or any, um, any surgeries or anything, and if you get a narcotic, what can happen is when you take that, it can get those receptor sites going again, 
and you're off and going. So you may need to come back in for maintenance. It's something that you're going to have lifelong. Bob. Julie, a couple questions for you. How would I know in the urgent care whether or not someone is in the methadone program if, for example, they are drug-seeking? They're not stating that they're in the methadone program. Is there a way for me to after-hours contact you bet. and learn? In the EDI system, all of our patients come up, and there's a, a part in the EDI system that says, it pops right up that says they're in the methadone clinic, and any questions, contact, and my cell phone's in that, and that's a 24-hour number. Okay, I so carry a cell phone 24-7. Lucky, lucky you. Yeah, um, and then also um, I have a computer, and we have our system. It's uh, my Evolve, and it's in the cloud, so I can get on at any time, and I can check a person's dose or if they've dosed with us that day. And what I've really worked with the emergency departments also to not dose our patients unless they're pregnant. And they've used to have that posted. I don't know if they still do or not. Because if somebody can't get down here to dose, it's kind of a behavioral change. If they can't get up out of bed and come down here and dose, we don't want them dosed at the emergency departments and using um, public funds to go do that. We want them to change their behaviors and get up because we're open from 5.30 in the morning to 11.30. And then the other question, you said... Um working towards a mental health license, what's necessary to get that licensure? Um, we have a lot of the paperwork done. It's getting it sent in and okay. just the financial and then having somebody with a mental health license. Okay. And so I need to get somebody hired to do that. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Does, does our, you, you said there was a psychiatrist? Uh-huh. Dr. Layton, what, what happened is I partnered with um, WSU, and so Dr. Layton comes in underneath WSU. And so he's a psychiatrist, and he, he used to be, actually, he was a medical director at Spokane Mental Health, when it was Spokane Mental Health, and now he's a professor at WSU, and he brings in med students also. But here. because he's under WSU, that would not be sufficient for Correct. us. Uh, other questions? Susan. So I get to hear Julie every semester. She and um, Lynn Everson from the Needle Exchange Program always graciously come to my community health class. And they um, spellbind students for three solid hours. Um, so what you got to hear today was really just a snapshot. And if any Board of Health members would like to sit in on that class session next um, fall, let me know, and I'll be happy to invite you. Thank Good you. Good job. Well, thank you. I appreciate you inviting us. I also have some books, and it kind of tells the difference about methadone and buprenorphine that I brought. I know some board members have this. And I know I had a question also about drug take back, too. And I brought some stuff about Snohomish County and what they do, too, if you want any information on that. Other questions for Julie? Actually, I had one that was related to the DTB topic and I don't actually know if it's for Julie or maybe Torney or someone else but I know that we specifically send TV funding as part of um, mm -hmm. what the county sends over so if you if we only have one case for example and it doesn't cost that much do you have to actually keep that funding separate in the event and and I guess what I'm trying to get is do you do you have to keep that separate so you have a, a reserve that's building up for those years that maybe you have five or seven cases or do not have to. No, that, that's an annual basis, and it's why we make a specific request based on kind of where we've been. Um, so we differentiate our TB request from the general fund request. Okay. Other questions? Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Board member check in. Uh, Mr. French. Susan. Okay. Shelley. Nope. Bob. Oh, Brennan, sorry. <laughs> Brennan, sorry. Um, yeah, new, new board member kind of question, but I'm getting bombarded with constituent concerns about oil trains rupturing in the river and getting in the water supply. And so, uh, and not to make that a debate at this table, but I think right now there's a lot going on in coal trains right now. And we got a presentation from Ecology on what health issues there are or not. So they said, no, there's no air issues from 
coal dust because it's too big, so it's not an issue. So at some point, it might be helpful to get actually credible data on what the issues are with drinking water if there's a catastrophe in the river. So just throwing that out there so people know. It's an issue that's going to be a hot issue this summer, I think. Thank you. Amber? Lori? Good. Bob? Uh, nothing else. So our next regular Board of Health meeting is June the 30th. At um, 12.30, we do um, have enough response for a quorum in that meeting, so uh, that will go ahead. Um, I would like to remind folks uh, that our Board of Health meetings are typically broadcast on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. and Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on uh, cable access. And with that, um, move for adjournment. Moved and seconded. Meeting adjourned. Second.